hold in my arms. This is okay. Well, I'll take this moment to do a good little book plug. Echt Besub Beer. Okay, it says the bruised reed. But as I look at the camera, obviously it's all backwards for you guys. But the bruised reed, Richard Sibes or Sibs? I think it's Sibes because there's an E in his name. But Dr. Lloyd Jones highly recommended it. And so I decided to check it out. He's an old Puritan writer. So we're talking like, you know, 400 years old. Really good stuff, though. Uh, Lloyd Jones, actually, in the back of the book, uh, he actually has the recommendation. And listen, it says, I shall never cease to be grateful to Richard Sibes, who is balm to my soul at a period in my life when I was overworked and badly overtired. And therefore, subject in an unusual manner to the onslaughts of the devil. You're overworked, overtired. Guess what? You're you're a good target. I found at that time that Richard Sibes, who was known in London in the early 17th century as the heavenly Dr. Sibes, was an unfailing remedy. The bruised reed quiet, quieted, quiet, quieten, quieten, uh, quieten, soothed, comforted, encouraged, and healed me. So you use Google, the bruised reed PDF. You know, this 400-year-old stuff, it's not copyright anymore. So you can get it. I, I did that. I sent it to a friend already who needed it. So he's got himself a, a copy of the book in PDF. And it's a pretty short book, um, short chapters. You can quickly read them. You know, just knock out a chapter at a time, set it in the bathroom. You can go through one chapter a day. Speaking of going through a chapter a day, we got through all of chapter 28 of Genesis yesterday. And... Hey, let's do something different today. If you like that we made it through a whole chapter, or if you just like that you're here, click the like button. That's pretty simple, right? All right, and we're going to do chapter 29. We got chapter 28, Jacob meets Rachel. So chapter 29, verse 1. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep laying by it for out of that well they watered the flocks, and a large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. Now quite often these were quite large stones, and one of the ideas behind it was that it would take multiple of the shepherds to move the stone out of the way, uh, to kind of keep people from going and getting water at other times um, and stealing, you know, what could be a limited water supply. And Jacob said to them, my brethren, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran, verse 5. And he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. And he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, look. It is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. And they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. So it's talking about how they gather together and they, they then move the stone. Now, while Rachel was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her. Or, yeah, while he was still speaking with them. Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. He got swole and yoked. He just, boom, I'm going to go and roll that stone away all by himself because he's in love. Love can make us do crazy Verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel. I mean, he just gets right to it, right? Boom, I'm going to roll the stone away, and then boom, right there on the lips, just give her a little kiss. And lifted up his voice and wept. 
and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebecca's son. So she ran and told her father. Man, I'll just pause there. We might not get a whole chapter in today like yesterday, especially since you know it's like another 20 verses to go. But here we have the beginning of the love story between Jacob and Rachel. Now, some cool things, you know, to see right there at the end. He kisses Rachel, he lifted up his voice, and he wept. Right after he moves away the big, huge stone. Now, Jacob, Israel, he's a man's man. I would highly advise, I just spilled out coffee on me. Ah! Oh, it went down my shorts. Yeah, okay, we're good. We're not going to be distracted. I'm just going to wipe the coffee into my hairy legs so it doesn't get on the carpet. So yeah, back to Bible study. <laughs> Jacob <laughs> is a great guy for us to learn from. And I would highly advise if you haven't uh, heard the message. I don't remember when I gave the message. I think in Hebrews, perhaps. No, I don't remember. But not long ago, we went back as a church and we looked at Jacob's life as a whole. We actually quickly flew through all of Jacob's life to take it from a bird's eye view because there's a lot of great stuff in there. We learn about how he was Jacob, but he gets renamed Israel, but then he gets called Jacob again, and then he gets called Israel, then he gets called Jacob, then he gets called Israel. But if you pay attention, it's kind of like he's born again with a new name. But quite often that old name pops up. And then when he's strengthened, Jacob is mourning at the loss of his son, Joseph. But then Israel girds up his loins. He, he builds his strength and says, I'm going to go to Egypt because I believe my son lives. And so it's this beautiful back and forth. One other thing we can learn about, uh, from well, from, not about, from Jacob is he was a very manly man. I mean, he... He rolled away that huge stone, but he also lifted up his voice and he also wept. And I think that's something that we need to give much credit to is that in the New Testament, Paul exhorts men everywhere to lift up their hands in holy worship. The, the idea is, is that a man is not just a tough man and a strong man, but a, a worshipful man. A man who can worship and, heaven forbid, even weep. He shows those emotions. He's thanking God and praising God that God has given him what he was looking for. And so, I don't know. I just, I like to see that about him. That, that he truly is a man uh, who is open before God. And it's something that we should all learn from. That we would be loud, jubilant in our worship. That we'd have raised hands. That we could weep. You know, it's a very un-American thing to do to weep, I think. You know, because we got to be tough. And we have to hide, you know, our hurt, our pain, our feelings. That's kind of the way our culture dictates things, but it, it never seems to be the way of the Lord because Jesus wept. He wept on multiple occasions, not uh, just John 12, 35, right? He, 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 he weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over Lazarus. I'm sure there's a lot of weeping that we don't have recorded in the Bible. And so just that idea. Uh, maybe, you know, I know there's a lot of ladies who are watching this, so maybe you guys find it easier to weep. But, you know, it's just that reminder for all of us, and the men specifically, that being hard and cold is, it's a very worldly thing for a man to do and be. It's what the world sees as manly but it doesn't seem to be what the Lord sees as manly. Because I think Jesus is probably the manliest man to ever live. And we can look and learn 
from Jacob, from Israel. A little bit about just praising God publicly, joyously, weeping. Notice again in verse uh, 11, he kisses Rachel, publicly showing affection to his wife, or wife-to-be, you know. Uh, he lifted up his voice. Once again, he's not the strong and silent type. He's the strong and loud type. He's strong. He just moved the rock. But he's also vocal about the God he loves. He's praising the Lord loudly with his voice. And he wept. So let's not be afraid to open our mouths. Let's not be afraid to open our tear ducts. Let's not be afraid to publicly dis display our affection and our love. So that's it's just the idea is, you know, quit holding back. Let the world know you're excited. You're saved. God is good to you. And you're a poor, lost, wretched sinner, but you have such an amazing Savior. It's worth weeping over. It's worth crying aloud over. It's worth showing some public signs of affection. So there you go. Now I'm going to put the coffee in my mouth. That's better than on my leg. Ah, this carpet's very plush. I could lay on the ground for days. This is good stuff. All right. You guys take care. Have a great day. Here. This is, our, uh, this is my, uh, my other show and tell. Everything's on the floor. Look at Calvary. Can you see the eyes staring at you? And the scary looking mouth. That's why Calvary's called the place of the skull. Right? Because it looks like a scary looking Skeletor head staring at you as both where Jesus was crucified and Prince Adam found the sword of power that turned him into He-Man. Okay, I made the second part up, but it's a cool little picture of Calvary. I like that. It's an old picture before the era bus garage was built and uh, they put the cemetery up on the top and so it's been kind of eroding the face. So if you go there today, it's not nearly as clear, sadly. But all right. I'm just going to ramble on for days if I don't get off now. So you guys have an amazing day. I'm going to finish my coffee. And I'm hoping to see many of you at church tomorrow. A church alive is worth the drive. Rick, if you leave now, you can join us. All right. See you guys. Mm, button. Push. Getting it.